Welcome to the milk bar. 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 Welcome along to episode 655 of the Milk Bar. Jason Price here with you as ever. And coming up on the show this week, we'll have a chat with Christopher Commander about the latest production from Sutton Arts Theatre. We'll talk to the director of the Chinese Labour Corps, Marcus Fernando, as he lets us know what's going on with that show at the Blue Orange in Birmingham. Also coming up, we'll be having a chat with Jaden Claymore from the Claymore Candle Company, in particular about their Valentine's Day offering and how you can make the love of your life uh, have a, a wonderful candle, which is going to improve their environment. On top of that, we're having a chat with Dr. Hilary Jones as we find out about the importance of losing weight to avoid certain types of cancer. And we've got Catherine Ryan, comedian, on the line too, as we'll be talking about what only when you're eating you are getting the most out of your food, but also the balance between that little naughty treat you can have and eating sensibly the rest of the time. That's all on the way on the show this week. <laughs> The Chinese Labour Corps is at the Blue Orange Theatre in Birmingham in the Jewellery Quarter, coming up from the 1st through to the 5th of February. It coincides with Chinese New Year for 2022 and marks a near period in history where so many people gave so much at the end of World War One to not only sort of rehumanise parts of the European continent, but also to allow those who'd lost loved ones to actually put them to rest. To tell us more, I'm joined now by director Marcus Fernando. Hello, sir. Hello. So uh, tell us a, a bit about the, the way this play has come together in its current form. Well, the play was uh, written by a uh, Birmingham person, Ian Henry, and he presented it to Blue Orange. Uh, and with, an arts, with the help of an Arts Council grant, we did some work on it uh, a couple of years back with um, a, a interesting part, part, part cast, part professional, part student mm -hmm. actors. And that involved working on the script, developing it further, and we were able to produce a performance but by then of course COVID had taken off so it was a zoomed performance a streamed performance mm -hmm. and that was fine that was a good way of developing the script but clearly there was a long way to go yet so again with the help of the Arts Council we're now going for um, our next stage on developing this script and this time we're working with a much smaller cast we're going to work with four actors who are um, English Chinese actors so mm -hmm. they're bilingual they speak Mandarin Chinese uh, which is very handy for us. So they are going to be developing the script further. Uh, we've got Ian Henry's original script, which we worked the first time round, uh, but we've also got some work done by another writer, Emma Cooper. And so part of our uh, rehearsal process, certainly in the first week, is going to be looking at these uh, two sets of writings and merging them mm -hmm. so that we can end up with um, the final script um, predominantly by Ian Henry, uh, and dealing with the Chinese Labour Corps. Yeah, because I mean, it is, it is a subject where uh, further research is, is, is still yeah, open uh, to be done. There's a, a greater understanding, there's documents that will come to light, and particularly uh, with the, the uh, release of information surrounding the census from 2021 this year, that'll start to give us an idea on who was where, and uh, job roles that are listed there will probably hark back to the, the end of the First World War. Indeed, I mean... that. It's, again, one of these areas of history that isn't greatly uh, well known. Um, but the Chinese were asked to volunteer in the height of World War I. Clearly, there was a shortage of manpower. Mm -hmm. And so the Chinese were asked to volunteer, not as combat troops primarily, but as support troops. So they would be digging trenches or whatever. So they wouldn't be on the front line. But the idea was it would release those troops who were currently involved to do that to the front line. But inevitably, the conditions for the Chinese Labour Corps got quite difficult at times. They were at times under shell fire and there were casualties. And more to the point, they weren't often very well treated. Mm -hmm. um, we, we've heard a lot recently about empire and colonial, colonialism and China was no different. In fact, you know, the British Empire was no different. All empires tend to be the same. They don't treat their surrounding countries well. That's why they become empires. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, all these troops volunteered with high hopes and believing they were doing something for, you know, your empire needs you type of thing, um, and found they weren't really 
often respected for what they did, or indeed understood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I mean, there, there would certainly be a, a language barrier there. Uh, we're particularly looking at a time where yeah, English was uh, a widely spoken language across the world. I mean, the sun still wasn't setting on that British Empire at the time. But uh, you, you are still looking at uh, people from a, a standard working class background within China who wouldn't necessarily have had exposure to the English language. And equally, they were in Europe. So the, the, there would be a, a, a mix of, of languages being spoken around them, which would have yeah, hampered a lot of the work they were doing probably in, in its own right. Yes, very much so. There, I mean, that, that would be one of the, more, the most basic of problems was the language difficulty. Some of the Chinese, the more educated ones, might have a, a knowledge of, of English, but many, as you say, wouldn't. Um, but there are also cultural differences and a simple lack of understanding or even knowledge of the Chinese culture um, also created a a vast degree of difficulties, a difference in personalities where what was perhaps treated as insubordination by the British army was actually just a cultural difference. It's just a different way the Chinese um, volunteers would react to orders. Mm -hmm. and, and equally, you're probably going to have a, a, a rather worrying level of racism there as well. Yes, I, I mean, I'm sure that did happen. Again, empires are, are always at fault, no matter which empire, in that they tend to look down on the subject countries mm -hmm. and treat them as inferior to the, inverted commas, mother country. And I think that was inevitably the case uh, in China, as indeed in most places with the British Empire. So, uh, yes, there, there was... Um, an inevitability that they looked down on their troops for a lot of the time. And of course, that probably meant that the British maybe didn't put their best officers in charge of these colonial troops. Mm -hmm. um, they probably put the ones they didn't really want in the more responsible areas. So, yeah, they may not have had a tactical advantage when it comes to dealing with you know, the mortifier which they often find themselves under. But uh, yes. uh, still uh, doing, as we've already said, what was essential work. I mean, when, you, when you're running any war, you need the people who are making sure that those trenches are ready based on the, the, the trench warfare status that they were looking at here. Uh, also, sadly, clearing up bodies. And, and that's where a lot of lives are lost during the, the, the clear up after a battle. Yes, uh, I mean, it, it's often forgotten. We always think in terms of the, the frontline troops and, and what they suffer, and, that, and that's uh, obviously very much the case. But the support troops also um, take a fair degree of casualties, whether it is bringing up supplies. You know, every army needs to be supplied uh, in position where they are. They need to have food bought up on a regular basis, and somebody's got to do that. They've got to have ammunition bought up on a regular basis, and, of course, they've got to have somebody taking the casualties away. And these people have got to be going into dangerous areas to do that. So the show runs from the 1st through to the 5th of February. Tickets are available from blueorangetheatre.co.uk. And as uh, so rehearsals are ongoing, I mean, hopefully we'll be able to have a, a chat with uh, some of the team who are working closely on this and have a chat with the cast via Zoom from a rehearsal in the, the next week or so. I mean, it, Wolverhampton's Ian Henry, I mean, he's, he's you know, well known in our area for the poetry and the writing that he does. So to, uh, to, to see a play that uh, is predominantly his work is going to be uh, another interesting one. And it must be great material to, to work with to be able to tell this story. It is fascinating. I mean, it's a story I was completely unaware of mm -hmm. um, before I came to this project. So it's it's exciting for me. It's been very exciting to meet um, actors who are from the Chinese culture as well. Mm -hmm. I'd have to say the auditions for this were, were quite interesting in themselves, being, again, under COVID restrictions. We did the auditions by Zoom, which is mm -hmm. unusual. Mm -hmm. So I ended up auditioning one person in his car. Yeah. He wasn't driving it at the time, but he was in between two places. So he auditioned in the car. Another person in the gym where he was working at the time. And another person who was in the toilet. Uh, because he was working and needed a quiet place to do this audition. So, no, yeah. Wonderful reverberation, though. I think that's the thing. It really gives <laughs> a bit of that, that bit on the voice, which allows you to, to get an impression of what they can and can't do. So uh, yeah, a, a challenge to put together, a challenging time for those whose stories you're telling, but one which is an education. As you say, you hadn't heard this story until I'd spoken to Ian about this. I, I wasn't aware that this had gone on. And it's not necessarily somebody, particularly based on where we are in the world now, that you consider to be an immediate ally when it came to uh, the work that was being done during the war efforts. <laughs> well, again, so... we've been hearing a lot about that recently, but times change and times will continue to change. Mm -hmm. Fingers crossed we can get to a peaceful planet where the, these things are part of the history and we, we learn from the past and not necessarily recreate it.
which is one of the reasons I think for having a play on this subject and remembering this, not letting it all fade away into the past. Mm -hmm. We do need to remember from our past in the hope that maybe we might not do it in the future. It's not showing much hope at the moment, but we'll, we'll keep on at that. Fingers crossed. We as a as species need to learn from our past mistakes, as I say. Well, Marcus Fernando, director of the Chinese Labour Corps, which is at the Blue Orange from the 1st through to the 5th of February. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. With a better health campaign underway and the concerns around type 2 diabetes and certain cancers which can be made worse or more likely to happen due to obesity, Dr Hilary Jones now joins us to give us some tips as we head through 2022. Happy New Year to you, first of all. Happy New Year to you too, Jason. So um, obviously we probably have piled on the pounds over Christmas, but uh, it's maybe time to start thinking about how to get healthy, not only because we want to get that summer body back and relax on the beach, but also because it has long-term health implications too. Absolutely. Uh, so it's more than just uh, wanting to look better on the scales uh, in terms of one's weight, uh, because we know that uh, being overweight or uh, obese carries with it some quite significant health implications going forward. So, uh, for example, it's associated with six major um, weight related diseases. We're talking about cancers of the colon, pancreas, kidney and breast, for example. We're talking about increased blood pressure, a risk of heart disease, which is increased and strokes, of course, that go with that. The risk of developing type 2 diabetes, chronic back and joint pain. And of course, more recently, we know that uh, being overweight is a risk factor for more serious infection with COVID. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of reasons for, for wanting to lose weight other than uh, just um, trimming down uh, as we approach summer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I mean, I, I've had you know, some stark reminders of this. Both my parents became type 2 diabetic. My mom's still with us. We sadly lost my dad to pancreatic cancer last November. And yeah, it was all surrounding the fact that uh, yeah, my dad's uh, weight had, had always been higher than it should have been since he was probably uh, around 30. Uh, having done a lot of sports in his youth, once you stop, that's when things tend to pile on. Now, I've never been that sporty and my weight yo-yos, but as a, as a bit of a reminder with the, 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 obviously the trauma in my family, I mean, at the start of December, I started to be I managed to lose a stone so far, but okay. the, the, it's, it's finding ways of doing that and making sure you maintain the, uh, the weight loss, but also do it in a, a way that's safe and sensible too. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's, that's why um, better, the Better Health campaign uh, is providing people with the tools they need and the partners they need to encourage them and to keep them motivated. Because we all make these New Year's resolutions, but very few people stick to them. So it's about keeping people motivated, um, keeping people realistic, uh, keeping them on track. Um, and I think with the partners that the Better Health campaign um, is uh, working in association with, people can do this. I, I always favour um, putting a name down for something, some event which keeps you on track. You, mm -hmm. you know, if you if you sign up for an event such as a 5K run or a, uh, or, or a, an obstacle course, um, you know, one of those sort of uh, um, mud runs, 
then you're more likely to uh, remind yourself why you need to increase your physical activity and eat healthily uh, and eat the right amounts. So mm. uh, something like that. But, but I think the, the, the partners um, that I'm talking about uh, include partners for physical activity and for healthier eating and weight loss uh, programs. Even the, the NHS uh, weight loss program um, can boast something like a weight loss of about 5.8 kilograms in 12 weeks, which is really good. It's a realistic target that most people can reach and stay with. Yeah, and uh, whether we know our weight's in stone or in kilos, we, we've got to work out what our correct weight is. And as, as you say, I mean, there, there are partners out there, things like physical activity will help. Obviously, moving about more using the stairs rather than the lift. Yes, throwing yourself at the gym will, can make a difference, but also it can be quite uh, yeah, uh, discouraging when it doesn't work out as fast as you want it to. And that's that's why we see gym memberships very often last only for a month rather than uh, making it into a, a new way of life. It's making sure that you find what is going to work for you because it will be different for many people. Sure. And it doesn't have to be the gym. I mean, the gym works for some people, but, for you know, being sort of uh, within four walls, uh, with other people sweating and puffing doesn't suit everybody and you know it, it doesn't have to be like that you can just you know a, a cheap old pair of trainers get out there go for a walk uh, a brisk walk uh, cycling most people have got a bike um, you can even do exercises at home so it, it needn't be um, under the auspices and the view of everybody else because that can be off-putting for many people especially if, if people have got a considerable amount of weight to lose um, so it's about getting empowered to do what you need to do and at the same time make it fun mm -hmm. um, and the, the 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 better health webpage is a really good place to go to it's nhs.uk forward slash better health and there's loads of ideas there lo loads of things that keep you motivated and on on track uh, to achieve what you want to achieve because mm -hmm. losing just five percent of your body weight it can make a massive difference to when it comes to to your heart rate and and then the way in which your heart's overworking at this time that's right. And a lot of people don't appreciate that being overweight causes inflammation within the organs of the body. Um, and it also um, predisposes to the more rapid division of cells within the body. And, that, and that's basically the underlying pathology of cancers. So if I were to tell you that there are about 12 cancers which are associated with being overweight, people would be surprised, I think. They might know about breast uh, and colon cancer being associated with being overweight, but they might not know about the others. Uh, I'm talking about esophagus, esophagus um, kidney cancer, liver cancer, ovarian, thyroid, um, uh, lining of the womb, endometrial cancer, in other words, uh, stomach and pancreas, those ones. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, it's important to, to, to realise that being overweight is not only um, something that, that people would rather um, they weren't, but it also has these health implications in terms of cancer, heart disease, um, kidney disease and liver disease. Yeah, you can certainly, if you are persistently overweight, more likely to have a shorter lifespan. And uh, I think, you know, that that it can really bring it home to people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there are ways of doing this. I mean, we, we, we hear about this sort of every new year um, and a lot of people uh, start off with really good intentions, but they, they can't keep to it because they try and overdo it. They try to do too much too soon. Mm -hmm. um, and then they get disappointed when they don't achieve their targets in, in a week. Um, it ain't going to happen in a week. That's the message. It, it, but if you set a good target for this time next year, this could be your year. This could be a really good year where you achieve your weight loss management targets, where you enjoy exercise, you become more sociable because you're, you're, you're doing something with, with other people, perhaps in a club or in a group, rambling or cycling or whatever. You sign up to something and, and you stick to it. And, you know, this year could be a new you. And it'll be three months before you really start to see and feel any difference as well. Well, if it's any quicker than that, it's not going to last. That's that's the message. You do it gradually and do it bit by bit um, and tell yourself that the, there aren't going to be any overnight results because the body doesn't work like that. It took a long time to put on the weight. It won't take as long to lose it, but it still take considerable time. So be patient and you will get there. Mm -hmm. And because uh, losing weight isn't as much fun as, as putting it on, but uh, it, when it comes to the, the feeling of not having eaten so much, actually, you do feel a lot better quite quickly, and particularly after we may have ended up with uh, almost a food coma over Christmas. Uh, not eating as much in January can make you feel a lot fitter and more sprightly quickly. Absolutely. Uh, you know, people feel that they're, they're more alert, they're, they're, more, they're less tired, um, they're more energetic. 
Um, a lot of people think you need you need to eat lots of food for energy. Actually, the, the opposite is true. You can make it makes you feel lethargic mm -hmm. uh, and, and slowed down and demotivated. So, you know, just stick to a, pl a sensible plan um, and you will get there. And, and yes, people do feel more more um, energetic when they start to lose weight and, and that encourages them to carry on. So you get past the first 30 days. Uh, and then it gets easier. It really does. And then the things like the, the hunger pangs that you have actually start to ease off. And you, you, your body's kind of got get used to the, the new diet. And uh, uh, I think, do stomachs become stretched and distended when you push through much through them? Is that actually a thing? And, and will they relax back to, to normal? Oh, cer certainly. If, you, you know, the, the stomach, um, con the, the, what you can eat, how much you can eat does depend on what you're used to. Um, so if you think of it in terms of the stomach contracting, um, it is it is a, a sort of muscular bag, if you like. Uh, and inside that muscular bag of the stomach, you've got your digestive um, enzymes. Um, so you need to look after your stomach. And, you know, I really like the Ayurvedic medicine um, image where um, think of uh, there being a small bonfire at the bottom of your stomach. And if you if you give it a little bit of fuel, you know, that bonfire keeps burning and, you, and, you, and that gives you the energy. But if you if you swamp it with too much, um, too many sodden leaves and, 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 and wet wood, you eat too much, you put the bonfire out um, and, and there's no digestive process going on and you feel stagnant. And um, I, I really quite like that image. A little, you know, feed, feed that stomach a little bit, little and often for energy and, and you will feel you know, much more active. And you, know, you talked about the different cancer types, you know, the stuff like esophageal cancer, uh, most likely caused uh, through acid reflux. If you're giving yourself heartburn by the amount you're eating, actually you're also directly putting at risk delicate, delicate skin in the body. Yeah, that's another mechanism whereby a cancer can occur in the gullet. Um, absolutely, acid reflux can predispose to that, especially when there's a cellular change at the bottom of the gullet as it enters the stomach, something called Barrett's esophagus. So, so um, all these things make a difference. Um, and, and if people can focus on the health benefits and all of them, we've got a wonderful animation that's going out across the media, looking at the various organs in the body and how they are visually affected by obesity. And I, I think that'll be quite a, an interesting learning curve for a lot of people. I, they'll say, I didn't know that, but now I do. It's another reason to uh, maybe rein in the extra calories that I don't need. Absolutely. Really brings it home. Once again, what's that website so we can find out more about the Better Health campaign? It's nhs.uk forward slash better health. Well, Dr. Hilary Jones, as ever, thank you for joining us. Have a brilliant 2022. And you. Take care. With Valentine's Day on the way and oh, the, the wonderful freshness we'd like to enjoy around our home. Candles are for life, not just for Christmas. Jaden Claymore of the Claymore Candle Company has just the product for you, I am sure. And he joins me now to tell me about how a small business gets going in this day and age. Hello, sir. Hello, how are you doing? I'm all right. I trust we're finding you well. <laughs> I'm good, thank you. Now, a busy Christmas for you last year? Um, yeah, it was all right. Yeah, it was quite busy, to be honest. Quite a lot of sales of the candles as well, yeah. Mm -hmm. So how long has the uh, the candle company been going now? So it's coming up to a year. Um, uh, and year. what's it been like? Because obviously this is uh, probably, again, like many people, uh, a sideline that you started during the pandemic, uh, in addition yeah. to, uh, to, to trying to get through the, 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 the terrible problems everyone's had in their day jobs of late. So uh, what was it like going into that sort of environment and uh, you know, coming up with a product which is yeah, something just a, a little bit different and uh, it's, it's got a nice bit of style, which uh, I'm sure your, your repeat customers are enjoying? Yeah, for sure. And, and I'm in a, a few shops at the moment now as well. So I do literally have the repeat customers that are going in store and everyone loves the design of the candles and obviously the strength because I make them so strong. Now, this bit I haven't tested yet. I have a candle in front of me. I have mango and passion fruit. And uh, the, the, the retro look here, because you've got the old, uh, is it, it's Dymo, isn't it? The, the, the raised... Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, Handmade candles with actual handmade printing on each. That does that Yeah, and with fun. that little label with the <laughs> dynamo, dynamo thing. Yeah, I have to punch every letter in, so I won't be doing that forever. But, <laughs> but I think it adds a, a nice feel to the, the the start of the product, and uh, it allows yeah. you to know that you what you've got there. So, but take off the lid, and uh, inside we've got a, a small heart on top of this one. Now, this is something which appears on some of your candle designs, uh, an actual extra bit which gives it a bit more personality. Yeah, um, not all of them, but um, a lot of them I do put little wax molded toppings on. Um, some of them actually relate to the actual candle. So I've actually got this one here. 
chocolate orange. So the chocolate orange one has chocolate bars on top. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, but yeah, like, like the one that you've got there, some of them just have random things on like a little part. Well, I mean, it's already smelling good, and uh, the, the the heart is melting uh, as we as we light the candle. But again, this is all uh, it, it's a personality, it's a candle with personality. And uh, how do you come about finding the different fragrances to use? I just literally, it's just looking on um, wholesalers and stuff because I get the fragrance oil in. Some of them I mix up myself, so um, like jasmine and coconut, etc. So m a lot of the candles that I that I have I just buy in the fragrance oil and then if I just get a bit adventurous one day I'll just play around with them and try to kind of make my own <laughs> and, and, and again it's that, it's that that makes I suppose what you're doing slightly different and your ability to deliver uh, and again it's all about supporting a, a small business and I think people really are focused on that these days yeah for sure small businesses are rising quite a lot at the moment so when you came to it were you expecting to have the level of success that you have so far no, to be honest, I didn't think it would go anywhere. Um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a massive success right now, but it is going well. It's Obviously, a good start, though, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I have my regular customers that um, order direct. I've got the regular, regular customers in the shops that I currently am in. Um, but it, so it is going well. It's, I've changed my look with the candles once. I did do a different kind of style with a woodwick. And then, I mean, that's just due, due to me changing things all the time. Mm -hmm. But so again, it's, it's a product which will continue to uh, develop and evolve. And uh, yes. with Valentine's down the way, I know that you're putting, uh, again, another huge amount of effort into that because I've seen that on some of the branding that you've put out on your uh, your Instagram feed. Yeah, so I've got a, a special edition um, Valentine's candle, which is a, a white frosted um, container um, and a look, luxury white box. And then I've bought a nice ribbon, red ribbon that goes around it. So you can check that out on my Instagram. Mm -hmm. So but it's on to, to check out and uh, say, uh, it's a sort of gift which people will use and enjoy and, and then want to go back to. So it's again, well, the branding is important. And uh, whilst the, the design uh, may change, so it fits different aesthetics, you can actually, you know, that you're getting the, the same sort of quality each time. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So where do people go to, to find out more about what you're up to with the whole of the work in the candle company? So I do most of my promotion um, and any updates on my Instagram, which is claymorecandle.co. Um, and then I mainly I sell um, directly from my website, which is claymorecandleco.com. And um, so rather easy to remember. Um, and then, yeah, I'm, I'm in a couple of stores. I'm wanting to get, I'm, I'm looking to get into more stores around England. I am a UK base, so I only deliver it within the UK. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm looking to go into like um, cities like Leeds and then Manchester as well next um so yeah it's fun to look forward to yeah and and, and good for delivering the product as well which is the, is the enjoyable part of all that and uh, yeah getting uh, your, your name literally as it's on all the candles but equally uh, yeah. the, the company name out there and uh, give us a rundown you mentioned a few of the flavors what else i say flavors aromas uh, what, what else have you got in there i think i've literally got about 30 um fragrances available 30 different candles um i've got a couple here um, so this is one of the most popular and it definitely was over Christmas. So it's the gingerbread one. Um, so I do them in two different sizes as well. So it's um, the large 400 gram and then it's the small one 50 gram. Um, the small ones are very popular at the moment. Um, but this is the gingerbread and obviously the gingerbread men. It's a great selling point, I believe. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, um, I've got... This is my new one recently. So this is espresso martini with um, coffee beans on top. Mm -hmm. And then I've got a, a range of some floral, um, some like white musk and amber, um, some lavender, et cetera. Um, but yeah, I'm forever just bringing new fragrances out because I just want to keep it fun, keep it fresh. Mm -hmm. But if somebody has got a favourite, you can uh, probably also accommodate them as long as they get in touch, even if it's not on the, the current range showing on the website. Yeah, yeah. So I do take um, any suggestions on what candles to, to actually make. Um, I have literally got um, made candles for certain people, etc. And I do take, as, as well as taking wholesale orders, I take custom orders. So if someone wanted to um, order a custom candle, let's say a large candle with um, congratulations in wax on the top. So instead of the to wax matter toppings, it would just be the word con congratulations. I did, I've done that before for somebody. Um, so yeah, it's anyone can message me with any requests. Um, 
I'm more than happy to follow through with them as well. Yeah, so yeah, actually a commission, a candle from the Claymore Candle Company, and it could be something specific to you. And uh, say so the, the, the gingerbread men are on top of the gingerbread, but it could well be that fits in with a, a look that you're looking for for a particular candle. And uh, it might be they, they could end up on, on you know, well, I'm all going for him, uh, passion fruit and, uh, and mango. That's a possibility, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> well, um, the, the the aroma from this one is great. I mean, what is the burn time on this? Because it's it's not moving quickly. So that one, the small ones are approximately twenty to twenty five hours. Um, someone actually did tell me theirs lasted longer than that. She was like, um, it's about thirty over thirty hours, and I was like, oh, well. I mean, if at least it's not lasting short a shorter period. So, yeah, I would go with that. Um, and then the larger ones are. Um, approximately 40 to 50 hours um or obviously just depend on how many times you blow it out etc mm -hmm. and you you'll we'll pop the candle on for a couple of hours a day potentially so you're getting a good month out of one of the larger ones and uh uh, the, the price point, I should think that sounds like really good value for money for a fantastic air freshener that's taking some of the, 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 the nasties out of the air as well. Yes, absolutely. Well, give us all those details again on where people can find you. Yes, yeah, so that's um, on Instagram, claymorecandle.co and selling directly from our website, which is the main Instagram bio, is claymorecandleco.com. And you can find all the details there. Well, Jade, lovely to speak to you. Thank you for joining us and keep making the world a fresher smelling place. Lovely. Thank you for having me.
42% of us dread the January diet, and it's about getting the balance right when it comes to our eating, particularly at this time of year. It's cold. You want to eat more. That's pretty much how it works. So tell us more. I'm joined now by comedian Catherine Ryan and also by Claire Thornton Wood, dietitian. Good afternoon to you both. Happy New Year, Jason. Hi. Happy New, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Hi. Uh, there we go. That, that, those are the niceties. But as soon as people start saying Happy New Year, you're also thinking Happy New Waistline as well. And this is not an easy time to uh, kind of get the, the food right. Uh, and Catherine, again, uh, you, you're always out on the road. So you must have a right struggle getting decent meals whenever you want them. Well, also, Jason, I don't love bread and I feel like it's ubiquitous <laughs> on trains. Loads of people say, oh, yeah, there's food. There's not food. There's just <laughs> bread. I don't eat that. I'm very <laughs> spoiled because I've been enjoying Gusto recipe boxes for years. So there's always something exciting for dinner in my house. And I'm very, uh, very much partial to leftovers. I'll eat that in the morning. I'll eat it at lunch and I will put it in a little container and take it on tour with me so that I have a delicious, you know, tangy veg pad tie or something on the road. So I'm never restricting myself. I'm never missing out. This is the thing, obviously, you've got to make sure you are eating the right thing and the right balance of food. And, and Claire, when it comes down to it, oh, we just mentioned, obviously, that Gusto is one way of making sure that you're getting something interesting and different to eat. And it's so easy to count the calories, too. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, Gusto have got a fantastic range of um, range of, of, of recipes that, that you can order. Um, you know, they've got vegan, they've got vegetarian, they've got fish, they've got meat, they've got something for everyone. They've also got... Um, you know, a lot of people will feel that they they need to restrict their um, the meals that we love. You know, you know the lasagnas, the the burgers, the takeaway type type foods, and actually, Gusto have, have also got um, kind of healthier options. Um, you know, in in that range, um, so they've just sort of tweaked the recipes, which is actually something I did when I was um, when I was a student studying my dietetics degree we were given you know like all the staple recipes that you that you might cook you know all of your pasta dishes your carbonaras and things and um we were told to go away and and, and make them healthier reduce the fat reduce the salt reduce the calories and you know come back with a with a new item so this is when yeah, i was a student we just good. ate whatever we felt like i mean that was the thing yeah. whatever was cheap is what we went for uh, and uh, but it, it doesn't have to be expensive either eating healthily and uh, again this is where the the the, the, the pre-measured portions you get in gusto work and, and, and Catherine, i'm going to guess again yeah you're busy the whole family are probably busy so uh, you're yeah, keeping that that right can it, without having to mess about weighing stuff is brilliant yeah i will admit that portion control is not my forte jason <laughs> but i do know that gusto's great value you the portions start at under three pounds each so there's a misconception a lot of people go oh you know i can't indulge in something like that you deserve it it cuts time in the kitchen it's always so exciting and um i just eat i do eat whatever i want i eat like a student i eat whatever i want <laughs> whenever i want it's just that i've trained myself just through um, exciting different recipes. I genuinely love vegetables. So I enjoy Gusto's turkey cheeseburger and it's a little bit less indulgent than you might find a regular cheeseburger in a takeaway in a restaurant, but you're just eating healthily, but never missing out. And the other night I made a plant-based linguine carbonara. And like Clara was saying, there are just ways to tweak recipes if you want to, if that's one of your goals to be more plant-based or to have less salt or, you know, to to, to make a change in the new year, you can do that in a way that's sustainable. You just adopt a long-term approach to healthy eating, never, never being on a restrictive diet. Yeah, because we're at the end of the first week of the year, and this means that people probably may have given up on their New Year's resolutions. And, and resolutions isn't the best way of doing it. It's all about making the change that's sustainable within your life. Yeah, yeah, of course they've given up because these diets are cutting out entire food groups or they've said, I will never eat another carb again. And no one can sustain that. And I want people to have fun in their lives, never to feel shame or feel like a failure. And that can actually be bad for your health too. Restrictive dieting, can't it, Claire? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 really bad for you for you to, to cut out um, food groups unless you're doing it for a, for a medical reason. Um, I mean, it's about thinking about balance. So just making sure that your portion sizes are appropriate. And that's one of the biggest things that people can, can look at actually. Majority of us probably do eat portions that are just a little bit too big. Um, so, you know, thinking about what, what the right size portion is for you, um, thinking about eating plenty of fruit and vegetables, you know, at least five a day. Some of the research is actually showing that we should be eating eight a day. Um, yeah. and, and, and just 
yeah I mean enjoying food and I mean it's a bit like you know we say a dog's a dog's not just for Christmas well I would say a diet's not just for January really it's not about a diet it's about having a real lifestyle change you know mm-hmm. embracing new foods new recipes new ideas um loving your food getting a bit more exercise getting out in the fresh air you know something you can sustain forever really yeah making sure it's not just that quick fix uh, and claire i'm, I'm, I'm just going to post this one so uh, if you're going to have a diet tip claire what would you give us uh, when it comes down to you know, making a the, the right meal for you that's healthy I would say actually one one good tip would be uh, I know that um, both Catherine and I love cheese, adore cheese. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you uh, you still use cheese in your cooking, but if you use a really strongly flavored cheese um, like Parmesan or a really, um, really mature cheddar, you actually need very little of it to get the cheesy flavor. So. Um, that's a really good tip, which will cut down, you know, the, the fat in the meal. And also, if you are having cheese, you can actually um, the softer the cheese, the the lower the fat content, so therefore the the less calories. So you know, if you do um, more towards you know mozzarellas, camemberts, brie, you know, they've got less calories in than the um, mm. hard cheeses. And by the time you get to cottage cheese, it's almost a liquid, so that must be really good for you. <laughs> no, I, I'm not a fan of cottage cheese. I can't. <laughs> quite see the attraction but oh, so, I no, no, okay. conflict conflict Catherine okay what are you going to give us as, as, as your go-to to, uh, when it comes down to eating something you know is going to be healthy for you I mean I would just say have a baby and nurse it because I've lost <laughs> two and a half stone doing that in the last five months but um I think I always view my children as a really good litmus for how I'm eating the way that I behave around food is teaching examples to my daughter. And what do I want my daughter to be eating? I don't want her just ordering off the kids menu when we go out and just having nuggets and chips. I want her to explore, to try lots of new flavors, to have different recipes that have fresh ingredients and vegetables and lovely herbs. And I also want her to have fun and have a pizza party with her friends if she wants to. So that's exactly how I eat. I just think view your own uh, diet, you know, not a restrictive diet, but your own way of eating through your children's eyes and you can't go wrong and sometimes as we say less is more portion control is the important thing and making sure you don't go ott uh because it it, it might be nice but the fact you don't like bread must massively help i think it does i really really dislike bread and i eat huge portions of it if i'm hungry that day i mean you can't it depends on what you're eating surely you could eat 12 apples and nothing bad would happen to you I, I think I should put that to the test. It'd probably be really good for me. I mean, I, I'm supposed to be behaving with my food at the minute. I'm, uh, I've managed to lose about a stone since last December. But wow. uh, uh, it's, it's just then, then trying to keep that focus so that things slow down a little bit after a while. And you have to make sure you don't yeah. lose motivation, don't you? You do tend to have a, yeah, kind of a, a really big loss or bigger loss at the beginning. And then it, 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 it starts to slow down. And that's when it's really hard to keep your motivation going, isn't mm-hmm. it? Do you know, my dad started walk back in Canada. I haven't seen my dad in a long time, but he uh, is reluctant to get a dog. I don't know why. I really feel like my dad should have a dog, but he won't get one. But he started walking my friend's dog as part of his health journey for 2022. And he's very popular in the neighborhood. I mean, other people are asking him to walk their dogs. I think just moving has really helped my dad feel better, have more energy. And he eats whatever he wants, you know. He's a chip off the old block. We both love a drink here and there. <laughs> hey, and Claire, does genetics play a part in this? Is the fact that Catherine's dad's looking fine means that she hasn't got as much to worry about? <laughs> um, I mean, that's an interesting question. I, I, I don't think we really can say that genetics plays a big part on it. But w- what, what does play a part in it is obviously if you have a family, the food that you tend to eat as a family will reflect the size of the overall family so you know that's it's really interesting what Catherine was saying I've got three children of my own they're grown up now but I used to be hugely frustrated when you go to a restaurant and all that's on offer for the children's menu is you know chicken nuggets and chips or you know tomato pasta I wanted them to experience the like you say the, the wide range of foods that we have so I think if you um I don't think it's particularly genetic, but I think it's it's more behavioural. So if you are bringing your children up to eat fresh food, to have appropriate portion sizes, to enjoy food, you know, to enjoy all types of food, then there's a better chance that, um, you know, the adults and the children in that family will will grow up to have a healthy relationship with food and, you know, be an appropriate appropriate size. And if we are looking for something interesting and different to eat, that's going to inspire us when it comes to not only our own cooking and the leftovers, which Catherine eats on trains, where do we go to for more information about Gusto? 
Well, you can see me eating leftovers on any national rail service in the UK. <laughs> you can go to the Gusto website to check out all their delicious ranges, 60 recipes a week. 50% of those are healthy choices. You don't have to make them, but they're there. Or you can download the Gusto app. Simple as that, dear, though. And, and Catherine, I know you're out on the road. What have you got coming up in 2022? Oh, my gosh. Well, I've written a book, so that's coming out in uh, paperback soon. And I'm also on tour all around the UK for most of 2022. So I'll be busy and grateful. OK, we'll look out for you in Wolverhampton. Fingers crossed you're heading away sometime in the not too distant future. Uh, Claire, do you have a tour as well, being dietitian, or is it not quite the same industry? <laughs> I, I, I don't have a tour. I mean, I, I, I get out and about on, the, you know, yeah, TV, radio and that kind of thing. But yeah, mainly it's um, clinical clinical work that, that I do. So uh, yeah, back and forth into London and out. <laughs> now again, all things that will keep you fit and healthy. Just make sure yeah, your diet like matches. Yeah, the way. Yeah. yeah, that's the way to do it. Uh, Claire Thornton Wood, dietitian, and Catherine Ryan, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your thank time. You. Christopher Commander is often involved in all sorts of weird and interesting projects, one of which has been in development for the last 18 months. has been running alongside all the running around he did up in the run-up to Christmas. He joins me now to tell me exactly what he's up to. Hello, sir. Hello. How are you? I'm good. I trust the world is treating you well in 2022. I, I, it's starting out all right. So that's, you know, that's positive. It's a start. Fingers crossed it stays that way. So what exactly are you up to? Tell me about this production. So uh, this is a production of Terence Rattigan's The Deep Blue Sea, um, which we started rehearsal for 18 months ago during just before the original, the OG lockdown. I, I don't know. Actually, it's about two years ago now, just in <laughs> Oh, goodness me. Oh, it's time time has flown by. Yeah, in a weird way, it has. It's both gone by very fast and very slowly. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a, it's a period drama set in the early 1950s, just after the war, uh, rationing is still in place. And um, it's, it's about this, it's about this woman called Hester. And it's all about her relationship with other people, and um, myself included, she finds herself uh, in an unhappy marriage, and she runs away with a with a young RAF pilot, uh, namely myself. And uh, it it's all about her relationship with uh, myself, Freddie, and um, her, her husband at the time. Um, and it's a real introspective about intimate relationships and, um, and about broken people when it comes mm -hmm. down to it. It's about what I find fascinating about Freddie is he's so, um, He comes back from the war and he hasn't, he's recovered physically. He survived the war, um, but he hasn't recovered mentally. Um, he has a, he has a best friend, Jackie, who has done all the right stuff. He come out, he came out of the war and he, he, he survived both physically and mentally. He has a wife. He has, he has a, a loving family. Yeah. He goes to the pub and all sorts of stuff. And he, he, he did it the quote unquote correct way. Um, and, and Freddie didn't, Freddie came out of it as a broken person who, who didn't quite recover. Um, he was a war hero and he, he lost, he lost that after the war. Um, he came back and he, you know, had to integrate himself back into society and, um, found himself he couldn't really do it so he constantly looks for the next the next high um sort of the adrenaline rush so he gambles he drinks and uh he he finds this he finds this older woman that he sweeps off her feet and um takes her on this sort of romantic getaway which which turns very domestic very quick and uh he 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 just doesn't know how to love. He doesn't know how to do it properly. Mm -hmm. um, and it's tough because he's found another mm -hmm. broken person and they're both broken. Um, and it's about their, it's about their relationship and um, about identity. It's about Hester finding her own identity. She was in a loveless marriage. Um, and, and she didn't really have her own identity. Mm -hmm. um, and the same thing happens when she goes off with Freddie. Uh, so this is this is a play about her finding her herself really 
Yeah, so I mean, she's, she's often been an accessory, unfortunately, and, 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 and treated as, uh, as nothing more than that, I'm going to guess. Uh, we're talking of a time where uh, it, equality wasn't even thought about. It's hard enough to get today, let alone uh, back then. Yeah. During the war itself, though, it had uh, seen women moving into to more roles in both industry and, and, and the workplace and really starting to value their uh, time much more, but still financially they were nowhere near as well off as their male counterparts, and uh, that in itself it all yeah, puts a background on, on someone and, and, and doesn't show their true worth when in reality they are worth so much more than society is telling them. And that's really when it comes down to it, what the play's about. It's not as I said, it was about identity, but it's also about yeah, it's finding finding her worth, and that comes through. Um, this love of painting that she has um, mm -hmm. and we see the progression of those paintings so this this whole play happens over the course of of one day basically so um it's not it's not real time but you see the progression of how these relationships either help or hinder her mm -hmm. and there are other characters in the play that that that, that boost her up that that make her find her worth and um, ultimately it's about it's about her finding herself properly for the first time for the first time in her life i think and and and, and through that i say i suppose that there will be hints of the the story and, and you'll get to know the people who are prior to that day but it's then building that into a, a future which is uh, you know, going to allow her to move forward and and you learn uh, what she's going to do to either you know, have this work out for her or uh, see how she finds herself by the end of this play. And that is sort of the interesting thing that we're starting to um, delve into in rehearsal. Because so, so what's weird about this process is that obviously we started it two years ago mm -hmm. um, and we had to come back at it basically afresh. We just had to wipe the slate clean um, Originally, had to recast one of the actors because their commitments, you know, over the mm -hmm. course of however long it's been, it's a surprise that we're all together. We still get to do this, thankfully. Um, but with some new, you know, new cast member, um, it's a new play, and we have to sort of treat it as that. Um, and and having a sort of fresh start, the same as Hester's having a fresh start or trying to have a fresh start. Um, it was interesting coming back into the rehearsal hall, feeling like this play is familiar but also that we have to treat it as a, as a new show. And so um, some of the character development is different mm -hmm. and, and, and sort of sitting with these characters, not knowing if we're going to come back to them or not, um, has, has, uh, has informed some of our choices on stage, I mm -hmm. think. Yeah. So, so tell us a, a bit about the company behind this. So uh, this is Sutton Arts Theatre in Sutton Coalfield. Mm -hmm. And um, the show itself runs from the uh, 24th of February to the 5th of March. So it's coming up quick. Um, we have a very fast turnaround, um, but it, it's sort of forcing our hand to, to do some really intimate, good, uh, intense work mm -hmm. rather than, than have a lengthy amount of time to, to relax with it. Um, we're sort of going at, going at it with some, with some force and vigor, so. But it is something you say you've thought about for you know, 18, 20 months now. So, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, you, you, you've had some uh, ideas on this one, although it may have gone to the back of the mind. I think with uh, actors, you, you often uh, still take something from every character you play. And, and that it's interesting that, you know, the way that so many people get to form you because of the point of view that you've had when you've worked on something. It's interesting because one of the things that draws me to Freddie is some of the stuff that that makes you uncomfortable about Freddy. When you when you watch, when you watch the show, you have a an opinion about him. Which hopefully, I'll be able to um, sort of toe that line between someone who is uh, who is broken, um, but also there is there is some pity for Freddy. Um, and I, I hope the audience sees that. I, I, there's, there's parts of it that are uncomfortable for an audience to watch because they they see the reflection of of some of his actions in themselves. Um, and that's sort of what draws me to this sort of interesting character. Uh, and talking about ruminating with stuff for the last two years, uh, some of that is, has informed, you know, my choices going forward for the next couple of months.
Yeah, cause, I mean, basically, you're looking at people who've been through Second World War, and that was horrific. I mean, we've we've suffered during the pandemic, and I'm not doing down anybody who's lost loved ones or anything, but the the overall country has been through nothing like what the Second World War or, or previous conflicts have been. Uh, we've 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 lived in an age where we've yes lost loved ones to this, but. It has not been the you haven't lost homes in the same way. There hasn't been destruction of property, and you know, the, the the overall infrastructure hasn't gone in so many cases. We've had a, a, a terrible time, but I think those in the Second World War were suffering more. Yeah, I mean, it, in some in some ways that you sort of don't think about nowadays. I mean, we we have the luxury of being able to. Um, to be able to be comfortable talking about our emotions, which they just, they weren't then. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, talk about PTSD and talk about dealing with stress and and um, depression just wasn't really a thing back then. So in people that, that were dealing with it and, and, and manifested itself in, in some quite horrible ways, um, and so, yeah, it's 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 also a show about it's also a show about mental health and, uh, and 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 dealing with the sort of stuff that stiff upper lip stuff that they just didn't talk about then. But mm -hmm. that's the the brilliance of Terence Rattigan's piece. It's it's so intimately written with conversations that that you realize you've had with people or you've wanted to have with people. Um, and uh, it was written when Terence Rattigan had just uh, broke up from 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 someone he thought was the love of his life and uh and you can see that you can you can feel the pain in some of those conversations you can sort of think that terence had this conversation with someone um yeah it's uh it's interesting well this is something to say you'll bring to the stage give us those dates as we go through from february through into march again uh february 24th to the 5th of march so a good long run for this as well. I know that February is a short month, but uh, it is still uh, going to be uh, a, an opportunity to, to to learn from this. And so, uh, although um, the, the, I've said that the, you know, the war was probably potentially more traumatic for more people all at the same time, uh, it, again, it allows us to to reflect on on where we are now. You've talked about the mental health side of that, and uh, certainly, you know, it, it is going to have so many you know, sort of resonances in the way we feel about our world now based on the pandemic that we've all been experiencing. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's oddly, uh, it's oddly a poignant piece as of, as of right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Where can we get tickets from? So if you go to suttonartstheatre.co.uk uh, and you go to their booking tab, you can find uh, tickets for all of the dates online. Check out those details there and get yourself along to what will be uh, an amazingly well-produced production by an amazing cast. And I know that the work that Sudden Arts do is always awesome. And the theatre itself is a wonderful home for the brilliant work that you do. Christopher Commander, thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me, Jason. <laughs>